This video starts in the live stream area before we go to the bench to do the usual teardown and analysis because I felt it good to actually show this device in operation. It is a Guinness Nitrosurge unit and I've been trying to get hold of one for a while. Thank you to Pat in Ireland for sending me one and some of these huge cans of Guinness to actually test it with. These are actually 558 milliliter cans, really unusually big, but the reason for that is because they are designed to give you a full pint of Guinness. So here's the idea. The device in here clips over the top of the can and it surges it with ultrasonic energy as far as I can see. It's rechargeable, it's got a little charging port at the back and a button to start it. And the procedure of pouring yourself a pint of fine Guinness is to open the Guinness. And this should be well chilled beforehand and left to settle for a good length of time. And then the port on top there lines up with this little port in the unit and you clip it on and it's got an O-ring that seals. When you're ready to pour, you get your glass held at a 45 degree angle, you push the button on the back once and the harp on top lights up and it is now surging and you hold it above the level and if you watch the liquid come out you'll see it surges white every so often well it surges pale creamy every so often and what it's actually doing is it's liberating the nitrogen that's used to give Guinness its distinctive texture uh, and after a certain number of pulses it will actually stop doing that it's a controlled amount of uh, nucleation. You can actually hear a slight fizzing noise in the process. Once you get up to a certain height, you let the Guinness settle and you can see the clouds of bubbles surging down to the bottom of the glass here. And it's forming its head and top. And the final stage of the pour, if I had the patience to wait for that, would be to just gently pour in the last bit. And it has stopped surging now. And this will just lift it up and give you your creamy head on top. Let me demonstrate the creamy head by getting it all over the moustache. Mm. Creamy head. Lovely. It works very well. And by liberating the gas, the nitrogen, into the liquid, because nitrogen is much finer bubbles, it gives it that nice, deep, velvety texture, as they say. But that's not what we are here for. We're not here for the velvety texture. We're here to open this and see what's inside. So let's do that right now. One moment, please. It is time to explore this a lot deeper. So here is the principle of operation as far as I can see. The unit has a detachable spout. You clip the can in and there is a silicone rubber seal here that forms a, well, liquid tight seal. However, to let air flow in as the Guinness flows out through this port and the nozzle, there are a couple of external holes here that when you tip it up, air gets in here and it lets it flow out. As it flows out, it passes I can't see anything yet, but it passes an ultrasonic tr transducer, is what I would think it is, that causes nucleation uh, of the nitrogen and causes it to come out of uh, suspension in the liquid. The unit apparently has nicometal hydride cells, AAA nicometal hydride cells, not changeable because it is ultrasonically welded shut. I'm going to use the Dremel to open this. Uh, so thanks to Pat for sending not just one, but two. He sent a used one. Uh, so that I could basically take this one apart without guilt, but other, use, keep using the other one for experiments, including will it uh, will it uh, surge carbon dioxide drinks as well. So I'm going to pause momentarily while I uh, cut this open with a Dremel. It's the only way I think I'm going to get in. But um, some guesses are that it probably uses a boost circuit. The circuitry I'm not expecting to be too complex. A boost circuit, microcontroller, uh, and then the little drive uh, inductor that drives a piezoelectric device. But it'll be interesting to see how that's mounted in here. But there's only one way to find out. I'll dremel it open and we can take a look inside. One moment, please. The deed is done. Let's explore. I have to say, not the easiest thing to open. I'm very glad that Pat sent an old one as well as a new one because it is very destructive opening it. Particularly because everything has been taken apart. However, here was the process. I think that the gold bit is a separate piece and there's two sections going on, but they are totally ultrasonically welded on, so they don't come off easily. I dremeled around the top line here, nothing happened. So I dremeled further up and a band of plastic came off from an outer shell. Or should I say an inner shell? Then I dremeled even higher at the top. 
and the top came off and that's the point with a bit of force that I got access to the interior. So this whole lot is cupped over the top and then bonded on for waterproofing. The top itself has the Harp logo uh, with a diffused optical light guide, light guide going up to it, uh, powered by a red and white combined LED. I didn't realise that uh, Guinness is part of the Diageo group. Interesting. Di Diageo are an enormous uh, liquor company. So let's go to the circuit board. Well, here's, I'll show you the case first. The USB port here has, if I take the circuit board out, has a bit of sealant on the inside. It's a separate module for that, just probably part of the waterproofing. And the button here is a very unusually tight sort of friction fit in a hole. It's got a little plastic pin goes through and uh, pushes against the button, but it actually feels not stiff, but it just feels like it glides through smoothly. So that must be part of the waterproofing. There's no obvious rubber seal as such that I can see. Just a very close friction fit, quite impressive engineering. The ultrasonic energy is imparted into the base. There's a little platen here. And on that platen was this ultrasonic transducer, literally just glued on with the wires coming off it. And that's the bit that uh, energises the, the nucleation of the nitrogen from the Guinness. Let's take a look at the circuit board. Oh, batteries. Uh, a couple of AAA nickel metal hydrides, as alluded to in the instructions, uh, says AAA 730, probably 730 milliamp power. I'm guessing that they've used these for a stable voltage of about 2.4 volts across the complete discharge and their ability to supply high current. Also, maybe to avoid the problems associated with lithium cells and their bad reputation for bursting the flames in products. Let's bring in the circuit board. <clears throat> so I'll zoom down this just a little bit, but it is quite a big picture. The back of the circuit board has the two cells on it, and uh, that's more or less it, just it's got the pads. It's got a large ground plane and the pads for the connection of things like the USB power in and the output to the transducer. The other side of the circuit board is much more interesting. We have the button that signals over to the processor. We have a little 3.6 volt regulator that boosts the 2.4 volts from the uh, nickel metal hydride cells up to through this inductor to 3.6 volts. We have the charge circuitry, which is very simple. It doesn't have to be too complex for nickel metal hydride cells. And the processor has a, some support components, lots of uh, positions to monitor the voltage presence of USB and stuff like that. And then it's got two lines that go over to a dual MOSFET package that switches the transformer, which has two primary windings. And it's got the uh, higher voltage secondary winding that goes through inductor and then has a capacitor and a resistor, quite a high value resistor in parallel with the ultrasonic transducer. Seems so simple when I uh, describe it like that. The transformer, I'm not sure why. The transformer had this little pad on top. I think it may possibly have touched the top of the case, not sure. But as you can see in the picture, it was glued down with the sticky glue to actually hold it in place. Uh, as was this inductor. So all the big components. I mean, it's a well-designed product. It is definitely well designed. Let's bring in the schematic and explore it. So I shall zoom down this. And it's divided into two sections here. The power supply and then the... Uh, I'll show you the processor side of it and the transducer. So the USB supply comes in and there are, these resistors are rough measured values. Because they're such tiny resistors, they're those horrible ultra minute resistors, uh, loads of space in the circuit board, but they chose these tiny resistors uh, which have the no, the no markings on them. It just makes it a bit harder to trace. I shouldn't confess to that or people have put them in everything. Uh, but there is a voltage divider and a capacitor and then it's the USB active which goes over to the processor. And what that means is that when you plug in the USB to power this to charge it, the processor knows that the USB has been plugged in. If the batteries were completely flat. Uh, when you first got it and you plugged it in, what would happen is that uh, this potential divider here would provide a gate signal, uh, a base signal, should I say, to this uh, NPN transistor. And that would pull down the gate of this 
uh, MOSFET. The MOSFET would then allow current to flow through this diode and this fixed value 12 ohm resistor into the nicometal hydride cell. Um, the processor can override that. If it wants to turn this off, it has a connection going over to the processor that it can pull low so it can uh, basically say charge, shut off. That's what I think that is. The nicometal hydride cells have a resistor and a capacitor for decoupling and then that signal also goes over to the processor. So presumably that's an analog input and it can monitor the voltage across the two nicometal hydride cells. Now it's worth mentioning, when you charge nicometal hydride cells, they can be trickle charged on an ongoing basis. Normally the way you'd charge them is you'd look for negative delta V. The voltage gradually increases and then it suddenly dips down again as the... Uh, electrolyte bubbles form in the plates. It's not like lithium cells that, you know, you get a nice decisive voltage that tells you whether it's charged or discharged. And there's no decisive end of charge state. It's often done by temperature, time, or looking for that, either uh, the voltage stopping at a certain level and not increasing any further, or dropping slightly. It's always a bit tricky. Um, often these charges will just basically go on a time basis and it's possible that processor, if it doesn't really monitor the, the voltage too much, it uh, may just uh, basically, just as a last resort, use a time limit before it shuts the charging off and shows that the charging is complete. One of the advantages of nicometal hydride, a huge advantage, and I think the reason they've used them here, is they've got a very stable voltage over the full discharge. Initially, they'll charge up to about 1.5 volts each, but that will quickly drop back to about 1.2 volts, and then it will remain that at that level for almost the full discharge. And in this application, that is quite important. So that's giving a nice solid 2.4 volts, which doesn't seem much, but it is being boosted in the next bit of the circuitry. As it's being boosted here, because uh, this is a little uh, boost regulator, 2188A, boosts it up to, well, your choice of voltages. This one was set for 3.6 volts, uh, little 22 microhenry inductor, and loads of decoupling capacitors. I've abbreviated it, I've not shown all the decoupling capacitors. They're everywhere, as you'd expect. Anything else worth mentioning in power supply? Not really. Let's go to the exciting spicy bit. The processor, not sure what it is. The power goes in. It's a 14-pin processor, and the power goes in in pin 2. And uh, pin 6 is the 0-volt rail. Um, also worth mentioning, these pins 3 and 5 are connected to... I'll just write it in here. Three and five are connected to these simple... I didn't see they were connected to anything else. Just a 10K resistor by the look of it. Going down to capacitor and going to an input. Maybe for a internal voltage reference or oscillator perhaps. I'm not really sure. Uh, that was pin two. And that was pin one, two, three, four, five, six for the zero volt rail. There is a button input and that button has a little tiny capacitor across it just for uh, probably because it's quite a long track it's just to stop it being triggered accidentally by external interference so there's a little capacitor across that so you get a decisive button press the two leds there's a 95 ohm resistor on one and a 180 ohm resistor on another i'm going to guess that 95 is for the white led which is a higher voltage um than the uh, red led which probably is the 180 which uh, has a uh, sort of the white one has a much lower voltage to drop, so it's a lower value resistor. That is a guess. The transformer has three windings. It has two uh, low impedance windings that are basically on the verge of being able to measure on a standard meter. And it's got the higher winding, which was six ohms. I put these in at one ohms. Uh, each of the MOSFETs driving that in the dual MOSFET package is a 10k pull-down resistor and a 300 ohm uh, gate resistor from the processor. So that's, uh, I'll write that there as well, 10k and 300 ohm. They will be alternating backwards and forwards at a frequency set by the processor. There's no real obvious means to provide feedback for resonance of the piezo, so I'm guessing it's locked in the process. And there is no crystal, so that does almost make me think that part of this is a load circuit for an internal oscillator, but I'm not sure. However, when it's uh, operating, it goes in bursts, it just clicks on, 
And the duration of that is probably just because of it ran continually. The dissipation from the piezoelectric transducer, which is this bit over here, would be quite high if it was running continually. But also, it would turn your entire pint of Guinness into foam, and that's not desirable. The output, and this is where it's the black art of resonance, has a 2200 microhenry inductor, that's this inductor here, and then a capacitor after it, a fairly high voltage, I'd guess, 5.6 nanofarad is what I measured in circuit, and a 100k resistor across it, and then the piezoelectric transducer. The piezoelectric transducer is chunkier than I was expecting, I mean, it's very nice. Quite an interesting thing, let me just uh, bring in the next exhibit. Next exhibit, please. I'll have to zoom back out for this. I opened the piezoelectric transducer. I was actually just expecting a little piezo disc in here, but in reality, there is one, but it's in this little uh, container. And uh, I can pull these out because, I mean, the whole lot's been pulled out. It contained bits of cork, bits of foam. It contained a little bit of circuit board material. It contained uh, a little bit of metal. And this spring also randomly appeared in the bench. I'm not sure if that came from that or not, but there is a little tiny spring possibly involved in the mix. At the bottom of this aluminium cup, the bit that actually goes on, and it looks like a proper decent transducer, is the piezoelectric disc, with uh, possibly one connection onto the aluminium cup and the other connection, this very fine wire going onto the top. Then was this piece of foam. Um, I don't know if that wire went came through the middle of the foam. It may have done. I wonder if they heat it and just stuff it through. I'm not really sure how they do that. Then was a piece of cork. I think the reason for the cork is to provide rigidity up top. It may actually sit down in a ledge. I don't see a ledge as such. Uh, then was a metal contact, which may make contact with the side of the cuff and therefore the back of the transducer. And then a tin, tin little bit of circuit board material. And as you can see from the goop, very hard to remove goop, very soft silicone. Uh, all that is put in place with the silicone in the top. So you end up with a sealed module with the wires coming out and... Uh, Ultimately, there's a void in here filled with foam and then the transducer on the bottom that excites the Guinness into nitrogen exhilaration. Uh, so what would the Chinese version look like? The Chinese version would cut every corner. It would use a lithium cell. It would use a standard little tiny piezo disc just glued on in there. And it probably wouldn't do a very good job of the of the nitrogenation, as the Chinese products often do. They tend to skimp in all the things that mattered. Um, it would also not be waterproof water would get in. This looks like it's done a really serious job of keeping the water out. This is, this is a professional design. It's very good. It's very neat. Um, but the Chinese copy would be all about show and not about performance. I wonder how that would work because, you know, the Chinese just copy everything. They'll, they'll make an effort to copy this, but they won't... Uh, they won't spend money on the luxury components like the transformer in here. They'll probably just use an inductor that size with a tap off it just to go through the motions of ultrasonic energy. But uh, that is it. It's quite a neat design. It's quite a chunky device. And, well, it works. As the nitrogenated Guinness flows through, it does release the nitrogen by forming that ultrasonic nucleation and uh, just causes surges of the foam as you saw at the beginning of the video. So it's a pretty neat device, very interesting and most impressive of all, it's, well for Guinness I wouldn't expect anything else, it is really well built.